everything that's happened to us has been like something out of a fairy tale. Those were the words of rack guitarist Robin Crosby, who was talking about the success of the band's first album, 1984's Out of the Cellar. Rat will go on to dominate the rock scene in the 80s with hit album after hit album, but soon enough, Crosby's fairy tale would turn into a nightmare. Stay tuned for the full story. Becoming a rock star was the dream of guitarist Robin Crosby, who grew up in San Diego. In the 1970s, he played in a local band named Mac Media, where he came up with the early versions of the songs Scene of the Crime and I'm Insane, both of which showed up on Rat's debut album. Eventually, Crosby left the group and joined a different San Diego outfit named Phenomenon. It was around this time that Crosby would meet a singer named Stephen Piercy, who was fronting a group called Mickey Rat. And by 1981, both musicians hadn't yet played in the same band together, but they moved to LA with their respective groups, hoping to land a major record deal. Also joining Crosby on his journey from San Diego to LA would be his girlfriend and future model and actress, Tawny Katane. We'll talk more about her in a bit. Piercy would recall to the San Diego Tribune during a 1984 interview why he moved to LA, saying the only bands that were getting signed to record contracts in San Diego at the time were new wave type bands, so I decided to take my band Mickey Rat to Los Angeles. Los Angeles proved to be a much more fertile ground for the type of rock and roll that the two musicians were playing, given the success of LA based bands like Van Halen and Quiet Riot. And it wasn't too long after the pair moved out to LA that their own bands fell apart and Piercy and Crosby soon started playing together under the moniker Rat. Piercy would discuss the importance of Crosby joining the band and how he was instrumental in establishing Rat's sound during a 2011 interview with Noise Creep saying, I brought Robin into the lineup. Together we laid down the foundation for what everyone knows as the Rat sound. In those early years Robin was pretty much the main guy. And the band would undergo several lineup changes before finally settling on the musicians that got them a record deal with lead guitarist Warren Demartini, drummer Bobby Blotzer, and bassist Juan Crucier. Piercy would recall the twin guitar attack of Demartini and Crosby telling Noise Creep, Robin had his own style, but he was definitely influenced by Billy Gibbons and Jimi Hendrix. He played with great feel. Warren was more of a noodler, a guitar hero type of player. They complemented each other so well. Warren was progressing so phenomenally that it was hard to ignore, he'd say. Shortly after their formation, Rat would play at the Whiskey A Go Go and soon earn the status of house band. It was during this time that they caught the attention of Marshall Burl, who was the nephew of comedian and actor Milton Burl, who would appear in the band's future music videos. Burl would sign the band to his Time Communications record label, releasing a self titled EP that sold so incredibly well that it caught the attention of several labels. The band would eventually sign a major recording contract with Atlantic Records and release their debut album Out of the Cellar in 1984. Appearing on the front cover of the band's first EP and LP would be Crosby's girlfriend Tawny Katane. Out of the Cellar would be the biggest album of the band's career going triple platinum and the album was spurred by the single Round and Round which got heavy airplay on MTV and was a top 10 hit on the music charts in America. Guitarist Robin Crosby would tell the San Diego Tribune in 1984 how Rats separated themselves from the other rock bands at the time saying, we definitely try to be melodic so that we don't get caught up in the heavy metal shuffle, but I think our music is more aimed at a female audience than a lot of contemporary hard rock bands. Part of our plan was to attract a female audience. We try to come off with a lot of sex appeal in our lyrics and our look rather than having a violent or rebellious image, he'd say. While the band would never match the success of Out of the Cellar, they continued to dominate the 80s with their subsequent albums all going platinum. Crosby would end up co-writing many of the band's big hit songs, including Round and Round, Wanted Man, and Lay It Down. Crosby's grueling touring and recording schedule, in addition to Tawny Katane's busy career, got in the way of the pair's relationship, and they soon stopped seeing each other exclusively. At one point, Katane was rumored to be involved with football player O.J. Simpson, and here's an entertainment report discussing their relationship and Crosby. But these days, Tawny Katane is most famous for her frequently reported off-screen relationship with O.J. Simpson. 
Before O.J., however, this man says he was Tawny's romantic lead. He's Robin Crosby. Robin says he and Tawny started dating when they were in high school in San Diego. After graduation, they moved together to L.A. with dreams of hitting the big time. We were like first lovers. Um, it was peaches and cream for a long time. You know, she's a lovely girl, obviously. But things really came apart when he says Tawny began her affair with O.J. Simpson. He wasn't happy about her seeing other people at all, regardless of who it was. Robin says O.J. was particularly angry that Tawny continued to see him. I heard that he t had told her that he didn't want her seeing uh, that damn rock and roller anymore. Were you afraid that O.J. was really going to physically attack you or worse? You know, I didn't want the guy to break my neck or anything. You know, I'm not a little guy, but I think, you know, he's used to running over guys bigger than me, so. After his relationship with Katane would fall apart, Crosby would marry Playboy Playmate Lori Carr in 1987. While Rat were playing to sold out arenas and delighting crowds, turmoil was growing in the band. Frontman Rick Piercy and drummer Bobby Blotzer were at odds over how the band should conduct their live shows. Also going on was that Crosby was feeling overshadowed by lead guitarist Warren Martini. Nicknamed the King due to his large 6 foot 5 stature, Crosby felt marginalized and felt his role diminishing in the band, both on stage and in the studio. And to deal with his bruised ego, Crosby started self-medicating with both drugs and alcohol. It was a destructive path that would lead him to leaving the group. While he would hide his addiction to heroin from his bandmates for several years, it finally caught up with him in 1990 and it soon affected his playing. As Rat headed into the studio to record their album Detonator in 1990, Crosby left for rehab to deal with his demons. And while Robin did play on the record and get some writing credits, it was Rat's first album that didn't go platinum, instead being certified gold. Following his stint in rehab, Robin joined the band on tour, but staying sober was difficult. He would play his final gig with the band in early 1991 in Osaka, Japan. Before his final gig, his bandmates found him polishing off an entire bottle of vodka backstage, and during the show it became apparent that Crosby was in no shape to continue on with Rat, and he would leave the band following the performance. Robin would head back to the States and check himself into rehab once again, but it would be short-lived and he would soon be replaced by former Scorpions guitarist Michael Schenker. Rat wouldn't stay together much longer, disbanding in 1992 after tensions rose and the group's brand of rock became stale thanks to the rise of grunge. Crosby's departure from the band only made his personal life worse. He would get divorced from Lori Carr in 1991 and focusing on what lied ahead, Crosby wanted to get into producing and he did work with a few bands, but his addiction was all consuming. He would tell VH1's Behind the Music that he soon developed a $500 a day habit. His ability to start a new career would also be met with devastating news in 1994 as he would be diagnosed as being HIV positive. He wouldn't go public with the news until 2001 during one of his final radio interviews. Several years after his diagnosis in 1996, Rat looked to reform and according to the website Sleaze Rocks, Crosby was asked to move back to Los Angeles. At the time, he was living in El Paso, Texas, and excited about the possibility of a reunion. In anticipation of playing with his old bandmates once again, he sold all of his possessions and wanted to start fresh in LA. But things fell apart once the band got into rehearsals. It was apparent to the other members that Crosby was in no shape to play as the guitarist had gained significant amount of weight and was still using drugs. The band opted to reunite without him, the sidelined, Crosby felt betrayed and his downward spiral continued. He would reveal to Mitch LaFon in one of his final interviews in 2001 how his hard partying lifestyle took its toll on his health, saying, Apparently my pancreas has given up and I'm not metabolizing food the way I should. It's real frustrating. I have a roommate that probably weighs 150 pounds and eats a lot more than I do. It's not like I'm a pig or a slob, he'd say. In the same interview, Crosby admitted that he was living in hospice care which is typically reserved for people who are facing an incurable life-ending disease. His ex-girlfriend Tawny Katane corroborated this as she was still in touch with the guitarist in the final months of his life. She would tell Mitch LaFon in a separate interview, I would go up and stay with him at the nursing home. He could not stay at Cedar sinai He got so big that beds could not accommodate his size. That's why he moved into an old folks retirement home. They could accommodate him better. Kurt Dudley, who became friends with Crosby in the final two years of his life, published his time with a guitarist online. 
He would reveal how Crosby was disappointed that even though his former bandmates lived about a half an hour away from him, they rarely came to visit. Dudley would also go on to claim that he knew the end was near for Crosby when he started living with an old partying friend of his in May of 2002. Then roughly a month later, on June 6th, news broke that Crosby passed away due to a drug overdose at the age of 42. During his 1999 interview with VH1's Behind the Music, Crosby seemed to accept his fate, revealing, When I die, nobody cry at my funeral. In fact, let's all have a party. I lived the life of 10 men. I lived all my dreams and more, he'd say. Following his death, his former bandmate Stephen Piercy would fondly remember his ex-bandmate telling Classic Rock Revisited, The guy was king in our eyes, he was Robin, he was our leader, and he was my right-hand man. It was terrible, it was just bad all the way around. He was a soldier we lost in the rock and roll war, and I'm sure he won't be the last. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. We'll see you again on Rock and Roll Your Story Sticker.